It's the fourth series of the evening. We're on Frozen Temple once more, spawning to the bottom right hand position in purple. It's Koshki. And to the top left in red, it's Piscolita. Our first PvP of this season, actually. As well as the game between Ryza and Anolia was our first ZVZ. We didn't have any mirror matchups in the first three weeks, but now they're finally coming in. I think we're even missing... No, I think next week is a TVT um, between Zilvanas and, mm, and Miyako, I think. But we'll have a look at that later once the first broadcasts are done, and then we'll have a look at next week's matches. And you can, of course, always have a look at that later on. So, Koshki going for... Ooh, a proxy pylon right inside Piscolita's base, right at that ramp. So, with a forge, going for a pesky cannon rush here. Wow, and even stealing the gas, making it even more difficult for Piscolita to hold this. So, first cannon going down, and this is the time where Piscolita actually needs desperately to, to, oh, to, to get some probes from the line in order to take this down. She now sees that there's a second photo cannon in, uh, whopping in right at the moment. She, she actually needs, she needs to, wow, what she's doing? She needs to pull more workers once this, ow, yeah, this, this, this thing here just gets cancelled. But of course, there's still the photon cannon down here, which is actually in a very problematic um, position. You cannot really get a full surround with probes here, so taking down this photon cannon is really problematic. But once it goes down, there's this one pylon uh, giving you a vision of the high ground. Now Koshki can just cancel that one and just leapfrogging forward her cannons over here. This kind of pile, this can will just get covered by this photon cannon over here. And once one of these photon cannons goes down, it will be very problematic for Piscolita to still hold this once this uh, once these the, the, these cannons just reach the uh, nexus and starting to firing down at these uh, gateways and uh, buildings over here. So yeah, just first taking out the photon cannon. Uh, the taking out the gateway over here um, stalker being more but stalker not really the best thing to do I mean of course you can just try to um, kite a little bit uh, with these photon cannons I mean they will always just hit you a little bit but at least you can just try to shoot at them then move back regather shields but it still won't really help out gateway goes down and with it the possibility of Piscalita to produce units she just GG's out and Koshki takes the first game with a mean, mean, mean little cheese here. We're on Frost for the second game of this series, spawning to the bottom right in purple, the best color for Protoss, as we all know. It's Koshki, who's just won the first game with a really mean cannon cheese, but it worked out quite well. And to the bottom left, in red, uh, from Argentina, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's Piscalita. This is actually also something I like a lot about the FSL, that we have so many players from so many different countries. That's just great. I mean, I'm not really the kind of country guy uh, with national pride or something like that. Absolutely not. I mean, national pride is actually a word I try to ban from my vocabulary. But uh, still, it's just great that we have so many players of uh, so many different skill and age levels from all over the world. It's, it's just great that StarCraft gives you the possibility to meet all these different people uh, from so many different cultures. So just great, great thing to have. Every time I'm just casting these things and do something for the FSL, uh, like organizing something or just talking to players, I just feel so happy inside. You would believe it. So, okay, Koshki just going for the uh, Nexus after the gateway. Standard opening, pretty much. Uh, in this case, of course, you don't want to wall off uh, because it's not a Zerg player she's facing. Uh, you normally want to have your buildings close to your first pylon because uh, in case that your opponent tries to go for an early push, you always want to have the pylon just covering all of your important production and tech buildings uh, with a photon overcharge. And you don't want to have it in front of um, your base because uh, units like stalkers can just pick off 
um, at your buildings with a mothership core down here, for example. So maybe your photon overcharge won't reach the units down here, but the units down here will reach your buildings up here. And that's why you normally never want to really close your ramp off. Of course, still some people try to do it because they expect adepts to shade in. And uh, sometimes they then even just wall off completely for a few seconds, cancelling the pylon afterwards in order to prevent the adepts from shading in. But uh, that's not very common anymore. So, uh, we see the same thing up at uh, Piscoida's base. This one pylon just covering everything around here. And even a second pylon, so this one won't be an Atosis pylon. So if you unpower this one, not all of these three buildings will be unpowered as well. Uh, while also taking a Nexus. So whenever I see Protoss expanding early on, it always reminds me of the early Wings of Liberty days, when it just was impossible to ever expand in PvP in most cases. People were just going 4-gate all day long, and every time a player tried to do something different, they just got raped. So no, that was, that was normally not a very good thing to happen. And... Uh, Heart of the Swarm just changed a lot in PvP with uh, the Photon Overcharge on the Nexus back then. Because from then on it was finally a valuable thing to do in PvP to expand. So, both players just going for actually almost the same build. So we have two Stalkers out trying to get some damage done on this pylon while retreating every time the Stalkers come close. But Koshki now has three Stalkers in position, so now she can just go out for go out for an all-out fight and Pisco Leader will just have to retreat in just a few seconds once Koshki decides to move out completely. But for now she doesn't really know where the Stalkers are, maybe assuming that her opponent has already got back. But yeah, this is actually... Ooh, let's be careful here. Uh, fortunately for Pisco Leader, Koshki reacts a little bit late here so uh, she can now just retreat easily and uh, save all of her stalkers for later while we have a twilight council going down for Piscalita so probably going into some sort of DT build this might be quite interesting why our opponent just going for the robo build so if of course Koshki just has enough observers in place the build won't really accomplish much but having DTs out on the map is always a good thing to have and of course you can still morph them into Archons later on. But maybe it's only for some sort of upgrade, maybe Blink even. Could also be Blink upgrade, not even the DT, or not even the Dark Shrine. We'll see what's coming up in just a few seconds. More gateways being morphed in. So I'd rather go with Blink here. Yeah, and there it is. So she, uh, is, uh, that was just uh, an educated guess because she had a lot of stalkers already being produced. So Blink is of course the best upgrade. If, if you want to build an upgrade, you normally want to have an upgrade for, the, for a lot of units you already have. And stalkers were the units she had most of. So yeah, Blink was actually a good choice. And then with the other gateways warping in, you normally don't need these gateways as much if you want to go into a Dark Shrine and then produce more Dark Templates out of it because they are so expensive. So yeah, Blink was actually just the logical choice from there on. Koshki instead uh, taking a third base very early on, uh, five minute mark. Uh, against a Protoss is, uh, I wouldn't say totally uncommon, but uh, well, quite quite early on. So also going into a later on Twilight Council, researching some of these upgrades. So Koshki definitely preparing for a macro game, trying to build up the great death ball of Protoss and then maybe just rolling over your opponent, if possible, if your opponent just doesn't have the means to stop you. So more Blink Stalkers, uh, not yet Blink Stalkers, being in place to shoot down that hallucinated Phoenix denying some more scouting information. Let's see what Koshki has actually seen. Well, most of it. So only the Twilight Council not here, so Koshki doesn't really know that her opponent is going into Blink Stalkers, but with seeing that many Stalkers around, she might assume it at that point in time already. So Mothership Core and the rest of her army down here. Well, actually, this of course, uh, this of course might suit uh, Koshki's tactic quite well. She for herself now going into Dark Templars and uh, this might actually cause a lot of trouble for Piscalita. I mean she's still on two bases, she has a lot of pylons spread out her base so if a warp prism tries to warp in somewhere she's probably going to see it with one building or the other. She also is going to have bling stalkers so it will be uh, quite easy for her to take down a warp prism 
uh, even when it's moving, but of course, uh, especially when it's in the phasing mode. So yeah, mm, I mean, Dark Templars could be problematic, but needn't be, so we'll see how it's going to work out. Of course, the biggest problem right now is that Pistolia doesn't have any detection. Oh yeah, she does, never mind. But it's only one, um, it's only one observer that's with the army now. And uh, if a warp prism, for example, just makes its way its way into the main base, there's no de oh there is detection. Okay, never mind. So yeah, actually, actually, Piscolita is quite prepared for any kind of DT harassment. Yeah, Nexus for her now going down, but of course she's already in a disadvantage since uh, Koshki has had her own Nexus for quite some time right now. Okay, a few stalkers moving in, probably trying to blink into the main base from here on over the ledge. And here you go! Okay, they will probably be able to do some damage because it's going to take some time for Koshki to get her army back into her main base. Yeah, even a... Uh, oh no, there's, there's her own uh, Dark Templar right now, but of course an Observer is with the army. So, okay, not, not really that much damage dealt. One pylon over here, one pylon over here. Unpowering three structures is of course a big deal, but now Koshki is just going to replace these pylons. It's something she can afford easily. And, um, yeah, I mean, of course, it's just a little nuisance, but nothing that really keeps her from outproducing her opponent uh, during the next few minutes, maybe. But, of course, she's uh, gathered a little bit of time here for herself. And uh, still gathering a bigger army with Archons and Immortals. So, let's see who's going into high attack afterwards, or if both players are just trying to go into a, an Archon-heavy composition. Which has gotten quite popular since the Colossus got nerfed uh, at the beginning of Legacy of the Void. It got buffed a little bit more, but it's still just a shadow of its old glory from the Heart, Heart of the Swarm and Wings of Liberty days. So, yeah, since... Uh, well, be before Legacy of the Void, every Protoss normally wanted to have a lot of Colossi in uh, their army. And usually big fights just got decided by who got more Colossi with their army, but uh, that actually changed with the beginning of Legacy of the Void, and now people normally go for heavily immortal and Archon-based armies. Or if they can and their opponent let them, they just try to get the Golden Armada and a lot of... a lot of... Um, Sky units, a lot of air units, uh, in order to just overwhelm the opponent. But yeah, that's normally a difficult thing to do. I mean, the longer the game goes, and if you can just trade parts of your army, substituting them with uh, air units, that's of course a good thing to do. But uh, while it's still the mid game, or yeah, while it's still the mid game, it's always a problematic thing to do because if you just um, try to get more air units together, there's a quite big window where your air units just won't suffice if uh, the opponent decides to come over and kill you. Uh, so, nicely, nicely, um, uh, yeah, she, uh, nicely done by Piscolita here. She sneaked by a little probe over here, uh, planting down a pylon for maybe some DT harassment, but of course there's even two, three cannons down here, so DT harassment won't just do jack shit. So in the meantime, we have a little engagement over here. Yeah, force speeds just won't do anything because we have a lot of Archons mixed into both armies. So Archons are massive units and they just crush through force fields. So no chance um, for Piscolia to stop anything here. So, okay, did, yeah, did, uh, went for, no, that's actually Koshki's, uh, Koshki's DT here clearing up these Zealots over here and that Zealots won't be able to tear down um, the Nexus. So nothing really gained. Nice try by Piscolita here, warping in some units either over here or uh, probably over the warp prism. But yeah, didn't really manage to do that much since the DTs just cleared everything off. Koshki just follows this zealot over here, discovering the um, pylon in the process. And uh, Piscolita just <laughs> secures the Zelnaga tower with all of her units. Uh, actually, yeah, it's quite interesting. She even has an observer down here. I was just wanted, uh, just wanted to talk about that. That uh, you also, of course, have this um, second lane. You can normally send a few harassments unit over or across the map to your opponent's base. But uh, in this case, we don't even have a third base down here since both players decided to take a fourth and uh, third and fourth base over here. So now again, we have a big fight in the middle of the map. More units morphing in by Koshki. And it seems as if Koshki just has 
more of the high attack units, more immortals, more archons, and then, uh, then just some zealots to eat up the damage that your opponent can normally do, the damage that you would normally want to deal to the high attack units, and Koshki just pushes Piscalita back into her own natural base, she just desperately tries to morph in, uh, to warp in more units, but the units are just not good enough against what Koshki sends against her, the power of nine immortals just crushing everything, tearing down that base immediately, and Piscalita has to realize that's GG, and Koshki takes the second game as well. So we're on Apotheosis for the first time this evening. Not a very well-liked map by players. Spawning to the bottom right in purple, we have Koshki leading 2-0. And to the top left in red, her opponent, Piscolida. who's under a little bit of stress right now, because she has to win three games in a row, which is always a difficult thing to do. And uh, let's see what these two ladies have up her sleeves. Okay, nicely done here by Piscalita. Piscalita just checking the dark edges of her base for proxy pylons or proxy buildings even. That's actually something you should always do on Apotheosis. I mean, this map just cries for something like this. Uh, for, for a proxy pylon up in that little corner over here. And I think a lot of players tend to forget that. Especially when you're on ladder and just grinding game after game, I think you often tend to forget that until it happens to you. And then you will check these corners every time you get that friggin' map. Uh, but I think most players uh, have this map vetoed anyways. So, But in uh, professional play you see it quite often. So, basically you're just checking for uh, the gold base over here, but of course that's just the normal route a scouting probe would take. So nothing unusual here. Koshki took the uh, early nexus after the gateway, so normal gateway opening. Uh, having the pylon down here in order to cover most of the mineral line with a photon overcharge. If, for example, an oracle would fly in. Uh, you just have the chance to fire up that photon overcharge and protect most of your mineral line from that pesky oracle. Not all of it, uh, an oracle that like sits over here trying to shoot down the probes that uh, try to mine from that simulator. Uh, they of course can get shot down by an oracle and those one over here as well. This is why actually a lot of players try to plant down a pylon down here and over here in order to cover everything that's connected to um, harvesting. But, uh, of course, that's then two pylons you had to plant down close to your nexus, which is not always what you want to do, especially if you um, expand early on and you want to also have a pylon down here in order to protect your own expansion. So sometimes, as a Protoss, it's really difficult to decide where you want to plant those pylons. 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 So, Robotics Bay also for Koshki. I mean, it's it's the most common opening. Everything else is a bit risky if your opponent just goes for proxy DTs or something like that and you don't have any vision. Uh, of course, um, gateway openings are, uh, Stargate openings are always quite common. Um, if you are a Valverse players, a Valverse player using Phoenixes, a Stargate opening can just wreck your opponent um, and he or she just won't even know what's happened but um, it's still pretty difficult to do it and uh, of course you have at one point either plant down some cannons in order to get some vision inside your own base or you have to you get an oracle for that detection. Like I said, um, DT openings, rushed DTs, can wreck a Stargate opening pretty hard if uh, you're not going for um, the right units, uh, the right units in the right order. So another pylon down here, again, maybe against some oracle kind of play. So Piscalita just walking in with two more stalkers, and now Koshki finally knows what she's up against. Probably the same old stalker build Piscalita did last time around. So um, she might want to look out for Blink, 
and we also want to do that because the Twilight Council has already been thrown down. Seems as if we see mostly a repetition of the second game. Maybe a bit quicker, it depends. So, second base already saturated for Pescolina, at least almost, only two more probes missing, and two more probes for this assimilator. In the meantime, we have more units being morphed in, and the unbuildable bricks taken out of the way. So there's the blink. I was just waiting for it. At the same time, we also have a Twilight Council. Yeah, Koshki can lay back a little bit and relax. Actually, I don't really like her map vision, which is almost non-existent. So if her opponent really decided for some sort of heavy aggression push with a proxy somewhere, she wouldn't really be able to identify it early on. She'd just see it when, once it arrived at her base. So, hmm, a little bit more map vision would actually do her good, I think. But in the meantime, she's just taking her sweet time, tacking up, going into the Dark Shrine once more. So like I said before, it's actually going to be almost the same kind of game with the same kind of unit composition for both players. And again, we'll just have to ask ourselves who is going to have the bigger army with uh, the high attack units, with more of the high attack units. Because last time it was Koshki, and she just waltzed over her opponent. And uh, we'll see whether Piscolita can do the same thing back to her this time. Darkshawn almost done. No proxy pylon in position yet. Uh, is there a warp prism on the map already? Let's have a look. No units. That was actually the tab. No warp prism in place as well. So it seems as if Koshki doesn't want to use her DTs for harassment, but mostly for warping Arkans. Taking the old base now, which is uh, a usual decision, of course. You can, of course, take this one of the third base, but why would you? I mean, there's a gold base available over here. There's even a nice little choke point over here where you can halfway easily defend it. And, uh, of course, you have that... Um, you have that... Um, ramp over here but it's not that wide uh, then you have that wide open space that is where you shouldn't let your opponent get to uh, so that's again why it's normally very important to gather some intel uh, about uh, where the opponent's army usually is because uh, you normally want to catch them here and not want them let to get uh, want them you not want to let them get uh, to that wide open area where they can attack you more easily so, Pylon already down here, so it seems as if Piscolita wants to go into the third base as well, and here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Or it doesn't. So there's the Warp Prism now, with four Stalkers actually in it, which is quite surprising. I think Piscolita... No, Piscolita hasn't gotten the Dark Shrine yet. Oh, I thought she had. So, it's going to be Stalkers, uh, but okay, you know, they are not doing that. Doing some probe damage over here, but the War Prism has already flown away, leaving the poor Stalkers behind! Oh my god, all these... Ah, oh, that's not very honorable of you, War Prism, what's up with you? Just leaving all of your uh, all of your brothers behind? Wow, I mean, this, this must have been a racist War Prism. Uh, so, so these were all here, uh, they, these were all dark... Uh, Dark Protoss units, the Stalkers, and uh, this... Uh, okay, Koshki in the meantime uh, managed to build up her own War Prism, just uh, used it to bring some DTs into the back of Piscolita's base, but Piscolita had an Observer and a Standing Army ready, so not much damage taken by her. Still, she's very behind in economy, the gold base being up for um, Koshki now for quite some time, even harvesting golden cakes now, which is quite cute. Look at the golden cakes here. Isn't aren't they adorable? It always looks so funny if um, or so cute actually. It's not really, not really funny. It's more cute if uh, the SCVs, Terran SCVs, just construct something with um, a cake in their left hand and then just using the right hand to construct something. The same with minerals, of course, but with a cake, it just looks more adorable. So more stalkers being warped in. Actually, more stalkers than the warp prism can take. So, hmm, I'm not quite sure what Piscolita really wants to do. Maybe she wants to attack at two um, locations at the same time. Maybe luring most of her army back into the main base and uh, then attacking at the third base at the same time. That was actually quite a nice idea. In the meantime, Koshki even taking a fourth base over here. 
So more upgrades getting in, both players just preparing for the big army engagement uh, while in the meantime trying to do much, uh, trying to do some damage to their opponent's mineral lines, just throwing them back a little. In Piscolita's case, more playing catch up. Ooh, move command right into Koshki's army, losing six or seven stalkers for free here. I think it was six, I think there were eight stalkers to begin with. But yeah, a lot of stalkers being lost, and now we have uh, some more stalkers in the background, only taking out one pylon, which is not really worth it, not even getting the second one, uh, but finally she can load it in, so at least not losing all of them. In the meantime, Koshki just pressures, um, or just, uh, yeah, just trying to push over to uh, Piscolita's base, just realizing that she's... Um, throwing a lot of minerals and resources into this little harassment. So I think she assumes that her opponent won't have that many units at home. And in fact she really doesn't. If Koshki just realized that her opponent's units are mostly over here, tearing down this rock tower, that would just be devastating for her opponent. In this case she doesn't just try to move into the a natural base. Uh, now some... But this is of course now, yeah, the choke now working against Piscolita in some sort of way. She would really have to move her units a little bit more forward, maybe even trying to tear down the rock tower herself, but of course then she'd just give up her own second base, although the natural is just getting raided by a lot of uh, DTs anyway, so she's already lost 22 workers and realizes she can't take down the army. Koshki takes the series 3-0. to